So the, this presentation is going to start and talk a little bit about uh, different types of deals. And we will start by looking at the investment grade and versus speculative and how to underwrite deals. Let me just keep rolling forward. Uh, this is a disclaimer. This is for educational purposes only. We're not attempting to sell securities or anything at all whatsoever. Uh, I'm in the private lending and fund management business. Information presented here for educational purposes. Prior to make, making any decisions, please consult with your attorney or financial advisor. And uh, I manage a couple of funds, of lecture fund being Tampa Opportunity Fund. Um, all funds can only be offered through a private place in memorandum. If you're interested, you would have to re request that before making any decision. Anyway, let me keep going forward. Who's Big Mike? Well, that's me. Uh, I, I, I happily uh, married for almost 20 years, four kids and a cat. And I'm a CEO of TF Management Group. We have two funds, our flagship fund is Tampa Opportunity Fund, our legacy fund, TF Investment Fund 2. Uh, retired software executive, as I mentioned, I went full-time in real estate 2009, sorry, uh, full-time re real estate 2009, but started investing in 2000. And um, uh, my specialty is short-term bridge uh, lending and financing. Also do long-term equity investments focused on predictable cash flow and value-driven -add appreci appreciation. Many different uh, asset classes, self-storage, multifamily, retail, office, and so on. Uh, I do have a book out. You're welcome to get a book on Amazon. Uh, it is available in uh, audio format and hard copy. If you email me, I can get you a hard copy without uh, charging the Amazon fee. Just send me an email saying you are one of Ryan um, Ryan's members, and I'd be delighted to send you a free book. And I do have a podcast called BigMikeFund.com, and uh, it's a real estate podcast. Let me keep rolling forward. A little bit more information. This is how to find me: TampaFunding.com, BigMikeFund.com. Come. And if you misspell, misspell it and you, you wind up at a website, bigmikefund.com, it's not a kinky site. It'll just redirect you to the regular uh, bigmikefund.com. Let me keep going forward. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about pros and cons of investing in syndicated real estate. So being very sophisticated audience, and Ryan, we spoke about this. You have great, sophisticated, smart audience, and I'm delighted to speak about very interesting subject here. So syndications um, could be very significant ways to enhance your portfolio, invest passively, get tax depreciation benefits, uh, take advantage of a strong sponsor experience and track record, uh, deliver great returns uh, due to the value at part of the project, leverage returns, good management, and so forth. Uh, the well-structured project could deliver strong cash flow and also ca capital gains on the back end. And uh, you could, many of syndications have preferred return in them, and those are all benefits of a syndicated investments. But on the con side, on the negative side, I wanted to also mention for the folks to be aware that uh, syndications do have some, uh, not necessarily problems, but just just call them caveats or side effects. So number one is you have no control over your investment. So when you invest in syndication, you're sort of at the mercy of a sponsor. As long as the sponsor does great work, that's that's terrific. Your liquidity is limited. So this this is in comparison to funds like yours or mine. When you invest in syndication, a syndication has a life cycle of seven years. You're pretty much stuck with a life, life cycle. A few syndications give you cash out options, most of them you pretty much have to uh, write along. Mm -hmm. uh, distributions you can reinvest, so just you know be aware that uh, funds you could reinvest in syndications you cannot. IRA investors should be aware uh, that there is a risk of UBTI tax, UBIT, if they invest in syndication with a leverage uh, over debt, uh, finance or mortgage. Just uh, consult your CPA before you put IRA money into a syndication. Uh, typically, syndications, uh, in contrast to funds, don't have uh, diversification. They're focused on a single deal, and there are no guarantees in syndications like uh, many other parts of real estate. Just be aware that a preferred return is not a guaranteed return. Uh, in many cases, it is a uh, likely return, but it's not guaranteed. Let me keep rolling forward, please. Uh, go ahead. Definition of what a syndication is. Oh, sure. So syndication is typically uh, an investment vehicle. Um, 
it is a pooled money vehicle where there are many investors, um, more than one, let me put it this way, multiple investors investing into a single asset. So the money is pooled and uh, uh, the asset is acquired and managed. Very common examples, multifamily. So let's just say a $10 million multifamily complex is acquired, down payment is uh, $3 million uh, and the capital needed for innovation another million dollars. So the syndication raises $4 million, gets a $7 million mortgage, and it's capitalized at $11 million, full acquisition plus a million dollar value at, and it rolls forward. The investors uh, participate in the $4 million equity syndication, uh, and they could buy in units. Uh, and let's just say 40 investors get together, each puts $100,000, and they wind up raising four million dollars. That's a classic simple syndication. So th keep that in mind here <clears throat> as we're going through this tonight. What what Mike is sharing with us is is not just about how you underwrite the deal, but he's also sharing with us how you underwrite or look at the structure or what I call the access point to the deal. And a syndication is a form of an access point to the deal. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, in a matter of speaking, for sure. Um, Very good. All right. All right, let me keep rolling forward. Uh, I appreciate your uh, step, stepping in asking questions, but let me keep going. Here's a quick comparison of individual deals, some of them syndications and some just, just conceptually think of the single asset, uh, whether it's a syndication or a uh, single property versus funds, just a comparison slide. So uh, be aware when you're investing into a single asset, whether it's a you know one property, commercial, or it's a syndicated multifamily, there's still risk concentration. You're, you're in that one asset. If there are issues, problems with an asset, you 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 are you, know, you have high volatility of return related to that performance. Funds are generally diversified. That's one of the benefits why funds provide lower volatility and high diversification. Liquidity is typically limited in a single asset because that asset needs to be sold or refinanced upon improvement completion in order to get liquidity. Um, funds generally have better liquidity because they have quarterly, you know, just example of our funds and your fund, quarterly uh, subscription and redemption. Uh, potential liability risks, again, if you're investing in syndication, you're not gonna sign a uh, personal guarantee, but if you're investing in a um, single commercial building and the bank uh, asks you to sign on a mortgage, you may have no choice. Unless it's a non-recourse mortgage, you will be signing some guarantees with some liability risks. Funds generally are completely passive and you have you sign no liability. Again, um, individual deals could be more active involvement versus funds are passive. Uh, what's interesting, a couple of other points, when you uh, investing in a single deal, you could have idle funds between the deals while you put the money in the fund, the money is always working. Again, IRA investors, be aware of the UBIT risk uh, due to leverage. And typically when you invest in a single deal you got to have the right amount of money syndication you have flexibility because you're investing into a pool vehicle if you have 100,000 to invest that's great if you have 150 if the syndication hasn't been filled you could take a variable component the same is true with funds but the funds also have the the benefit of uh, reinvesting distributions so let me let me keep rolling forward into the core of the presentation but while you're doing that, Mike, maybe by show of hands there, you can raise your hand. How many of you are currently invested or have previously invested in a um, in a private placement fund? I know some of you probably are invested with Mike. Um, I know uh, some of you might be invested in any of our family funds, but just by a quick show of hands um, is to see how many of have experienced, Mike, just to give you some ideas here. So <clears throat> we have, oh, Probably about a, a third of our live audience right now has had some experience with fund. Maybe not quite a third, maybe about a quarter, Mike, have, have um, invested in a fund before. That's great. Uh, I appreciate uh, your experience. And uh, let's keep rolling forward. And, and hopefully um, information here will be easy to understand or you can ask questions. So let me go to the basics. Um, Warren Buffett's teacher was Benjamin Graham. And Benjamin Graham uh, was sort of the godfather of value investing, and he is one of the most fundamental investors out there, and people study him uh, through business schools and, and through life. And he said something very important, that an investment operation is one 
which on thorough analysis promises safety of principle. It's a key word here and a satisfactory return. So when you're investing, uh, the key uh, focus is uh, evaluate risk and uh, most investments are not guaranteed. There's still some level of risk and nobody's gonna uh, insure your principle. But the safety of principle is a difference. So understanding your risks, mitigating them, and uh, coming with to the conclusion that the principle is reasonably safe and the rate of return is satisfactory that creates an invest uh, an investment. Speculation is everything but that. In essence, speculation is a financial action that does not promise safety of the initial investment along with the return uh, on the principal sum. Though speculation, there's plenty of good speculative projects uh, and we invest in some of them, uh, but you absolutely need to be aware uh, if something is a speculative or investment grade. And we have to be careful, the naming convention, I use the word investment grade. It doesn't mean uh, guaranteed. It just means that uh, it meets our understanding and our requirements of what is investment grade. Let me keep rolling forward. Uh, okay, so this is the key concept here. And again, I'm using uh, our naming convention. This doesn't necessarily mean or match Wall Street uh, terminology. We call something investment grade where it has good downside protection. In other words, uh, something that should be able to withstand uh, difficult market conditions, some level of stress. And uh, again, it doesn't guarantee principle, but it provides reasonable degree of safety and, and, a, and a decent rate of return. And I consider investment grade deals, they typically have low or moderate risk. They don't have high risk. The moment deals uh, feel like risky, they are just speculative investments. They're not an investment, the spe speculative uh, projects. Uh, so in our quadrant space, we have four quadrants. Quadrant one, two, three, and four. Quadrants one, one and two are investment grade, and qu quadrant three and four are speculative grade. And um, uh, in the speculative grade, the downside protection is very light and they could have strong cash flow. By the way, if you look at this chart, there's a reason why uh, the average IRR, I'm not sure if, if the audience knows what is IRR, I can define it, it's defined a little bit later in the presentation, but let me just use it, it stands for instant internal rate of return. And what it really means is just an average compounded return combination of cash flow and a backend uh, appreciation, but it's an average compounded return versus uh, people use also a term average annualized return or average cash on cash. And they're, they're slightly different. IRR uh, is, is a little bit better for investors because of the compounding effect. So uh, what this uh, slide is all about is whenever you're looking at any investment opportunity, you should think about, is this an investment grade? or is this speculative? And in the, in, the, in the next couple of slides, I'll define and give you some examples of what, what are speculative deals and what are um, investment grade. And as you can see, as you are moving from quadrant one to two, two to three and three to four, the target IRR increases because the risk increases too. So it, 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 why invest into more speculative, higher risk things if you're not expected to make higher rate of return. It wouldn't make sense. So investors are willing to take more risk when they uh, see uh, a better carrot uh, at the end of the day. But in a minute, I'll introduce the concept of risk adjusted return, which will uh, kind of compensate and adjust for the risk. Any questions on this slide? I think we're good. All right, let's keep going forward. Okay, the next, the next point is I wanna make it very clear all projects have risks and we're all aware of it, but I'm gonna state this again. If you think that investment grade project doesn't have risk, you're mistaken. Everything has risks. Uh, what happens is investment grade projects have lower risk while the speculative projects have higher risk. And the investment in either speculative or investment grade is not guaranteed. Uh, very few things are guaranteed in the investment space. The moment you hear, by the way, the moment you hear guaranteed uh, it makes me very nervous. That's what Bernie Madoff did. He guaranteed his investments. So there's risk, and if you understand the risks and you can mitigate the risks, you can do very well. 
So here's a list of uh, possible risks, not all of them. Just, just be aware that there's construction risk whenever you're investing in, in a project that has significant constructions, local government, zoning rules. Uh, when you invest into any commercial real estate, there's always occupancy risk. What if the occupancy dro uh, drops? Uh, there's insufficient capital risk. Just always have to make sure the projects are well capitalized. They can run out of money. There's environmental risk. Uh, there's local and broad economic conditions risk. There's financial uh, risk. Uh, the results may not uh work out to be the same as they are projected there's a key man risk your project sponsor gets hit by a bus and it's a problem and there's a natural disaster risk so it's just a list of potential risks now you don't need to be fearful of risk you just need to understand what they are and be able to uh, deal with them let me keep rolling forward now we're going to talk a little bit about risk adjusted return and a little bit of volatility as well so roi by itself is not as meaningful as the risk adjusted ROI. Why? Well, because the projects have varying degrees of risk. And the way to think a little bit about this is when you put the money in the investment grade, strong cash flow project, and uh, it has pretty good downside protection. Well, what happens is it, there's not much risk in the project. There's some risk, but it's not catastrophic. So if you're thinking about your loss reserves on that investment, it's a small amount. So if an offering memorandum says the return is between 10 to 15 percent to investors and you know this type of project is investment grade, you could assess that the risk approximately is one percent. It's not an exact number, but you could sort of allocate some level of risk reserves. So one of the investment um, vehicles or investment types that falls in the investment grade cash flow qu quadrant are typically hard money loans. We do a good number of them, and they're secured by first lien position on a fix and flip projects. These type of loans, the loss reserves, are roughly 1%. You don't need more. These projects don't collapse. They don't fall apart. The loss to principal is fairly low. And, and uh, why do you need to adjust for the risk? Because some projects will go bad. When, when they do, you'll burn through the losses, loss reserves. So you need to... Uh, Whatever, pro whatever the uh, offering memorandum says, whatever the marketing material says, you still need in your head to write it down by the level of likely lost reserves on that project. So we always think about uh, that. That's why the projected return, projected IRR should be reduced slightly. The other important uh, point here is volatility of the return is generally low. So cash flow focused projects, again, first quadrant, uh, th these type of uh, deals uh, have projected cash flow and there is a little bit of variance, but it's not going to be high. In other, in other words, I've seen a ton of projects uh, with, let's just say, projected cash flow to be around 10% per year and a little bit of appreciation. You may have cash flow fluctuating between 9 and 11, but it's not going to be fluctuating drastically. It's not going to drop to 2 or jump to 18 percent that's the whole point these project investment grade generally a lot more predictable with lower volatility now let's look at the investment uh, grade uh, growth second quadrant this quadrant is very similar to the uh, first quadrant but it has less cash flow so less cash flow means that investors are trading off cash flow for a little bit higher upside um, but generally the loss reserve on investment grade projects even with lower cash flow are not that high. In this case, it's 2%. So let me give you some examples of the second quadrant. So examples of the second quadrant would be uh, non-performing notes secured by uh, real estate at a low uh, loan-to-value ratio. So we have investments in projects like this, and these, and these opportunities um, present significant downside protection because of a low loan-to-value ratio. Uh, and then they have significant upside because if you defaulted loan or cruise high interest rate, default rate. Another example of the projects in the growth quadrants are multifamily, some self-storage with light uh, renovations. So the, uh, the heavier renovations can fall into speculative grade, but light renovations can still be in the investment grade because the cash flow continues through the life cycle of value add. Uh, let me just now jump into quadrant three. In the third quadrant, um, 
Oops, oh, uh, sorry, I think I clicked the wrong button. <clears throat> what did I just do? Okay, we're back. Quadrant three. So in, in a quadrant three, it's a speculative grade focused on cash flow. Uh, the risk is high and the risk reserves have to be much higher. So risk reserves, generally speaking, in this bucket, it, uh, in, in, in our example, it's 6%. So let me give you um, uh, an example of that. The second lien loans, so it's, it's a loan secured by second lien instead of the first lien. They're earning higher rate of, of return, but their loss reserves are much higher than the first lien loans. If things go bad on a second lien loan, you could lose the entire principal. So you really need to account for much higher res loss reserves. And that's why the risk adjusted return on these type of deals comes down quite a bit from the target because of higher loss reserves. The fourth quadrant, the speculative growth uh, quadrant, are the deals, generally speaking, that have significant uh, risk, uh, ground up construction, development, redevelopment, and they need to have significant loss reserves because some of them will go bad. And the projects that will go bad will uh, set you back uh, quite a bit. So this is the concept of uh, risk adjusted return and volatility is generally higher on speculative projects than the investment grade. So Mike, this is this is really powerful here, what you're, you're sharing with us. And I'll remind all of our members <coughs> and some of you who are all at different stages with helping you develop this, but what this is starting to get to the core of Mike is what we call the family investment policy. And as each of us as individual investors, or you know, as we're investing our wealth, we have to create this investment policy to help give us some guidance on just what types of deals seem to make sense for our portfolio at any one time, realizing the needs of our wealth are constantly changing. And, and what, what, what this becomes incumbent upon us is to, understand where we start to fit in this. And this the, these quadrants that you're outlining, Mike, are really, really great and really, really helpful for us to kind of start to see ourselves, where do I fit? Where does my capital fit? Where do I fit that allows me to sleep peacefully at night? Realizing that all of our capital that we have that we're deploying, particularly into the world of alternatives, you know, funds like Mike's, syndication deals, direct deals, there's probably a portion <coughs> of our investing capital or a, por a portion of our overall allocation that might fit into every one of these buckets. We might put more capital into one of the quadrants over the other, but this is what is really critical of being able to understand, Mike, you know, what, what, what we work so closely with, with our members on is this whole idea of wealth organization. You can't know where you need to go unless you already know where you're at. And what you're describing here is a great way to further connect to our wealth and understanding how our specifically our investments are at and where we might need to shape those as time goes on. So th this is this is really critical here what you're sharing with us on that piece. Brian, and thank you for clarifying. Uh, I completely agree with you that um, and this is a great service that you provide to your members that you help them understand their picture today. If you don't know what you have or where you are, how do you know where you, you know? where do you need to go so having a having at least clarification of where your current investments lie where they fall in these quadrants may help you understand what what do you need to do next if you have a lot of speculative deals without even realizing it well you need to think hard now uh that all your alternative all your free capital should not be going into speculative projects uh, or the reverse may be true. You may be over conservative and just sitting with all your money in the investment grade cash flow and paying too much in taxes. And maybe you want to take a little bit of speculative risk because you're already heavily invested in the safer project. So it is very much uh, your type of a service where you need to sit down with folks and help them map out what works for each one. So I think we're on the same page. Let me keep rolling forward. Okay. So, 
a uh, little bit more information here. So I wanted to break down the IRR into two components. Uh, uh, typically, uh, return comes in the form of cash flow and it comes in the form of appreciation. So investment grade projects, uh, cash flow focused, have strong cash flow. Most of the return comes in the form of cash flow. And then some return comes in the form of appreciation. Depending on type of investment, there might be uh, a little bit of appreciation or a lot. It doesn't have to be uh, there at all. You may have just strong cash flow project with very limited appreciation. But cash flow is the king for this quadrant. And some of the examples of these deals would be our like a fund like Tempo Opportunity Fund, your Heritage Capital uh, Fund, and a uh, number of what I call in quality cash flow syndications, multifamily self storage, office, retail, and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit about that. What, what, what do they look like, quality cash flow syndications? Now let's move to quadrant two. In the quadrant two, the major difference in qu quadrant one and quadrant two is the fact that the, there's low or no cash flow. And that's okay. You just got to be prepared for it. Uh, some investors may perfectly be well suited for that. If they're not receiving cash flow, they may be deferring tax liabilities and they may be in great shape. They want a project to grow rather than produce a cash flow because of the uh, tax situation. So as long as the, the investment is strong on downside protection and provides uh, safety, uh, it falls in this in this category. So examples, some of the non-performing note, notes, individual or syndications with good LTV. Uh, some heavy value add multifamily deals uh, could fall in this category. Typically, the light, lightweight um, multifamily uh, deals live in the cash flow quadrants because they cash flow well through the value add phase. The heavy, a little bit heavier uh, projects, as long as they don't uh, fall into negative cash flow, they typically fall in the uh, investment grade growth uh, focused. The heavy, heavy value adds are generally sp speculative in nature because the cash flow turns negative you got to have sufficient reserves and um, uh, but just be aware that every investment doesn't have to fall exactly in one quadrant there are investments that could be sort of in two quadrants so a heavy value add that doesn't sustain break-even cash flow Maybe slightly speculative, but it's sort of on the border between investment grade and speculative. And it, it, it's a perfectly acceptable investment. You just need to understand the risks that negative cash flow is not catastrophic if it's only for a short amount of time and you have sufficient reserves. The speculative grade projects. Um, uh, so here's an example again. Uh, speculative grade cash flow projects have uh, strong uh, income, generally high interest rate. Uh, they may have some some uh, appreciation too. I've seen um, shared appreciation loans where it's very high interest in second position and, and, it, and it has a piece of the upside on the uh, appreciation as well. They, they do exist where there could be a little bit of an upside. Um, also heavily leveraged syndication syndications could fall in this category too. They could be producing good cash flow, but it's very it's very very speculative and cash on cash is strong. Uh, but if the, if the vacancy um, gets worse or there's other stress points, the leverage, leverage can, cash flow can fall apart uh, just because it's just uh, it's, it's over leveraged. So, Mike, let's talk about that just for a moment from this standpoint of underwriting the deal. And we're talking about underwriting the structure um, related to the deal, syndication of funds, so on and so forth. <coughs> What we have seen very heavily since 2008 is a significant amount of leverage placed on real estate deals. And we've probably seen that, Mike, consistently from 2015 right up till now, you know, February of 2019, because with, with so much what have, <coughs> excuse me, what has changed with Dodd-Frank, with lenders, not being able to lend directly as easily to consumers. It's made debt available to these real estate types of deals uh, commercially because there's been so much appreciation relatively rapidly the last 24 to 36 to 48 months. 
And what we need to be very mindful of, you know, Mike, when you and I are looking at deals, I mean, we have this conversation constantly. How much leverage is coming into the deal right at the get-go, meaning our equity investment is completely subordinate to all of that. That's right. And and if that is the case, for whether you're down in these speculative grade deals or as Mike, as you're defining them, these investment grade deals, too much leverage can kill any deal with the slightest downturn economically or if the project hiccups. And we're seeing a lot of those deals, Mike, that come through our investment committee that are levered to the hilt. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. We just saw recently a self-storage deal, uh, if you remember, that had um, 85% uh, loan instead of traditional bank loan. A 75% instead of a bank loan, it was a hard money loan. And the sponsor chose that uh, because uh, it was easier to obtain a more expensive highly leveraged loan than a conventional bank loan. So the investors participating in the equity were going to take even higher degree of risk. In today's environment, and again, now we're talking about quadrant four, ground up construction, redevelopment, land speculation, all these heavy um, value adds or, or, or completely uh, ground up uh, projects, uh, heavily uh, leveraged, they present tremendous amount of risk. They can build a building, and if the lease period uh, doesn't produce break-even cash flow, they're out of cash. They're going to have problems. Uh, the opportunity is, uh, you're well aware of the deal that uh, we are raising capital for right now in New York uh, on a uh, developed, finished uh, asset, a $20 million asset that, that is has a $8 million loan uh, and that asset is new construction and the developer ran out of money. They ran out of money and they, 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 they're hitting a technical default on a note and maturity. And that note is going to be acquired. And as an investor in the non-performing note syndication with strong collateral, we are in great shape. We're investment grade. Uh, we could foreclose on a much more valuable building. Now, if you're in that shoes of that owner of the building, you're in trouble. You, you basically now either paying high default interest rate uh, or, you, or you're going to lose your, your asset. So being an owner of these highly leveraged projects puts uh, you in a uh, high risk category. The project may fail. And, and the sponsors typically, they have no personal guarantee on anything. They, they, they will disclose through, through, the, through the roof. They get a competent lawyer. They, the PPM or the OM will have disclosures that will say, hey, listen, you know, you're taking all the risk. You're investors. You don't, and the sponsor here is going to do uh, the work to do to, to move the project through the life cycle. But if they run out of money, a couple of possibilities. One, there could be a capital call. Uh, and if, if, if there is no capital uh, call, they need to raise alternative capital and dilute investors. So at that point, the deal, when it's in trouble and they're raising capital to salvage the deal, all the vultures come in. So uh, you got to be extremely careful in these market conditions, trying to play the momentum game. The momentum of rising prices uh, is slow is, is is coming to an end. So we don't know. There might be a little bit more kind of an upside, uh, but the reality is uh, taking the same risk that you were a few years ago when the prices were depressed is a very different risk risk profile. You couldn't go wrong. Now you actually you actually can go wrong. And if you go wrong, you may lose all your money, the entire investment. So, so Mike, Peggy's asking a good question here. Uh, good evening, Peggy, too. Thanks for joining us tonight. She's asking, is heavily leveraged syndications considered at 50, 70, or 90 percent? So I am assuming, Peggy, you are asking that question. If you are an equity investor in the syndication, that has the leverage. So Mike, just maybe quickly kind of give us your thoughts on that as, as you're seeing them, what seems to be, at least in these market conditions today, an appropriate amount of leverage. I like syndications with leverage less than 70%. 75% uh, is absolutely borderline. Uh, if you go into 80% or 85%, that's, that's over leveraged. So 70% or below is reasonable, uh, reasonable leverage. Now, it depends what it's leveraged with, if it's leveraged with bank debt. So you could have 75% leverage with a bank loan, 
at a good rate, which which is absolutely acceptable. Or you could have 75%, sorry, 70% leverage with a hard money loan, which could have higher debt service. So I would say stick with 70%. You could you can go to 75 on a uh, good bank loan based leverage with long term fixed rate. Very good. So, Mike, we're starting to uh, come up. Golly, already uh, 45 minutes uh, coming up to an Let's hour. Let's keep rolling. Let's keep rolling. I got a lot of content. Let me let me keep rolling. Some of the other highlights. Back to your concept, right? So, next slide. Next slide. This is capital allocation. Uh, I'm going to stay only a few seconds on this slide. This is where you come in. You can help folks uh, make the decisions depending on how much capital they got, where they should put it. This is an example allocation, not right for everybody. But it just says 50% in the quadrant one, 30% in quadrant two, and 10% in each of the speculative quadrants. So it may, may or may not be right for uh, different folks, but conceptually keep more money in the investment grade type of deals versus speculative deals. Let me keep rolling forward. Quality cash flow. Here's just a basic example of what a quality cash flow could look like. Could be multifamily, self so storage, retail, office, so on. I, I generally like light or moderate uh, value adds. Uh, they're different for different types of deals. In a retail, maybe sell of an out parcel. Uh, in a self storage, it could be existing facility with a little bit of expansion, a little bit of land. You can, you can add a little bit more uh, units. With multifamily, it could be light renovations. Um, uh, also, a good uh, management improvement is part of the play, some lease up, some additional services, better collection, better tenant management, and so forth. Now, cash flow. I like to see uh, improving cash flow story. That's a, sort of a key um, metric to use. Uh, if you have a value add component, you could you could have light cash flow year one, and that's totally fine. Just understand what what the value add and numbers tell the story. So if you have year two improving cash flow and year three slightly improving cash flow after the value add, that's that's great. I mean, that's what you want to see. You want to see general improving cash flow. At times, uh, you have year four, year five, cash flow could drop a little bit. You should always ask the question why. And the easiest answer is the initial cash flow could be based on non-amortized interest only mortgage and then amortization starts kicking in. And that's an acceptable answer. Just giving you an example. Um, the question that was just asked, what's the leverage? I like moderate leverage, 60, 70%. 70 is a practical max. You could go a little bit higher, but at that point the deal starts looking a little bit more speculative. So th this is, I, I think, is a great <clears throat> point with the use of leverage here. Once again, what you know, we're we're not doomsdayers around here, Mike, as you know, but you know, we are risk managers at 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 some level, maybe a high level, especially you as a fund manager. You know, when you're working with all of your investors' capital here, and what we have to be looking at from a leverage standpoint is. You know, in, in all of our most recent history, we have to think about back to 2008. You know, I was just down in Phoenix last uh, last week, Mike, uh, with my project manager down there. You know, we've been flipping properties down there for know, 15 years, you know. The market, so market is softening now in Phoenix. It is softening a good amount at this point. It really, really is. And you have to think through, you know, when when I went through 2008, having a, you know, a pretty sizable portfolio of flips going on there. Why didn't we go down? And it had to do with the fact <clears throat> that we weren't over levered. I mean, we saw some of those property prices drop 20 to 50%. You know, some of those we held for rentals, some, you know, there was all sorts of ways we were able to manage it. The point is in your family investment policy, as you're thinking about this, you have to be able to understand if you're the, if you're the lender, that's one thing. But if you're in an equity position behind a lender, you have to start to make an assumption what happens. This is a little bit of an extreme, but it's the, the right mindset to be in. What happens if we experience an 08 again? Can the deal, even with a valuation decrease, still work from a cash flow standpoint? And that's part of then the function of how much leverage you would allow on a deal or want to have on a deal if you are an investor into that deal. Right, and that's a great, great point. Uh, if, you, if you can survive on cash flow basis, you don't really care if the price drops. From that perspective, you're in great shape. 
The other thing you folks can do is, is, is uh, do a stress test on the asset. So we do that as part of underwriting. So what the heck is a stress test? It's really simple. You can start with cutting the um, uh, occupancy by 10% and increasing cost by 10%. So whatever the project is, if it's multifamily, imagine you have now 10% higher vacancy and your expenses have gone up. And if you can manage that, you can still withstand cash flow, then you're in, in good shape. So 10% stress test is a good stress test. The 20% is, is pretty extreme in today's market conditions. But if you can withstand 20%, you're in phenomenal shape. In general, deals leveraged to 60 to 70% can withstand 10% test. Uh, the 20% test is, 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 is a hard stress test. You don't have to go that far. But at least um, uh, it's one of the ways to, uh, to see what happens if the market you know, economy slows down. Let me keep rolling forward. Um, mm -hmm. You should have a, a, a fair pref on a split. Here's an example, 8 to 12% preferred return. And typically the split 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20, depending on the type of deal in favor of the investors. I want to make it very clear. There's so many crappy deals out there you see circulating that have unfair splits. They have splits in favor of the sponsor. You would see 90, 10, and you think it's in favor of the investor. No, it's in, in favor of the sponsor. So you have to be extremely careful and read the documents and make sure that you're not investing into a deal that just uh, has terrible risk-adjusted return and one-sided towards the sponsor. You really have to know the sponsor um, and the kind of deals they're running. And the sponsor quality, the integrity, strong track record, good communications, and fair deals are critical. Yeah, it, it, and we're seeing a lot of that right now too, Mike, with, with the economy so good, real estate, you know, seemingly just keep going up and up and up. We as investors have to have our own responsibility for our own governors. And, you know, we, Mike, these come through our underwriting flow all day long. I mean, we probably, I, I don't even know how many of them came in on the heritage side today. There's just so much of this stuff, so much of this stuff because the market has become to believe that there is so much private investor money out there, which is true, and a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines, which is also true, even in this robust space, deal operators think they can put these half-baked deals into the marketplace and the unseasoned and, and the investor that doesn't have their own criteria in line will find themselves onto these deals, Mike. Am I saying that? correctly absolutely right uh, I, I like to use the term and i mean this with all due respect dumb and dumber money so there's a lot of that money just chasing deals they don't know they pull their money out of stock market or, or, or uh they just made some money in the past and they're looking for alternative investments and uh, they don't have experience to underwrite um there's a strong self-promoted sponsors who have massive Facebook following, um, Twitter, YouTube, social media through the gazoo. And their whole game is to keep raising cheap money. And they, they, they're not focused on finding quality deals and offering investors fair terms. They're focused uh, very much on finding cheap money and putting the risk on investors. So it's out so, there, and if you don't know what you're doing, then, uh, <laughs> don't invest. You, you're never going to regret the deal you, you don't invest into. So the, the, the point here is that uh, selecting quality sponsors of quality deals is work, and it's hard, and uh, but it pays off because you're going to get yourself in better deals with better risk-adjusted return, to keep it simple. So, Mike, here, as we uh, uh, come to the top of the hour here, one of the things what you just said that why even all of us, even all of us as Mile Marker Club members and as sophisticated investors, you know, we're getting pounded with these deals that come across all of our desks. And, you know, back in the poll, I asked right at the beginning of the webinar, but was about how, where do you find your deals? Um, nearly everyone that responded um, on the live webinar here tonight I put one of the options was I seek out deals online or online deals seek me out. Of all the five options or so we had out there, that was 0%. And this is really significant here to all of you, my friends, um, um, that 
you're you know who you're doing business with these deals that are just floating around the internet they're they're not even their own deals they're getting pushed and promoted and re-promoted and re-promoted in that and this is part of you know where we where we um uh, you have to be mindful of of what that deal flow looks like so mike maybe just take us uh through your underwriting slide here i'm seeing signs brian i see <laughs> Who cares it's at the top of the hour? This is good stuff, keep going. I guess, uh, Mike, that means we gotta bring you back. If I didn't have another um, <laughs> webinar uh, to do right after this, uh, with an, uh, we, 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 we could keep going here. So Mike, why don't you take us through this slide and then uh, we'll get you back on here for another call. Sure. Uh, the most important thing is don't respond to all these promoted slides, uh, mark all these promoted deals. You have to know the sponsor. If you don't know the sponsor, it's a non-starter. The internet deals that find you, forget about them. Don't, don't even waste time, it's spam. You absolutely have to work uh, to find quality sponsors through referral. We find every single deal, unless it comes through referral, we don't even talk to them. So referral is number one. Quality referral, uh, right the other day, you you, you you brought that multifamily deal in, um, uh, in uh, Maryland, and because it's a referral deal and there's a referral chain to the sponsor, we established a couple of different ways that's a starting point. So sponsor integrity, experience, track record is important. Uh, going through an asset review, why is it a good deal? A really important question to ask. Understand the value add plan. If it's renovations, rent increases, how long it takes, what kind of work, what kind of uh, improvements in the cash flow. Um, management uh, through the value add plan, pretty important that the people who are going to run the value add plan have experience uh, to do that understand the risks, do the do basic due diligence on the appraisal, feasibility study, comps, all these pretty st standard things to make sure that the uh, sponsor didn't just take the, the numbers, you know, off the top of their head. We do a typically structure and financial, a project financials review, uh, the cold capital stack, how much equity, how much debt, what are the terms, uh, current future projections, preferred return performance splits, um, Current projected cash flow is really important to see cash flows years one through five, uh, IRR calculations, fees and alignment of interest, another very important. I don't like when sponsors charge ton of fees up front just to jump on the deal. And then they also have um, heavy ongoing fees. What I do want to see is reasonable performance fee. Thank you very much again, my good man. I appreciate your time. We will get you back on here. We know we have, <laughs> there's a lot more in that uh, beautiful, uh, very smart mind of yours that we love to extract. And we so appreciate you sharing that with all of us. Ryan, thank you kindly for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be of service and uh, happy to come back.